Welcome to part two of the Arknights Contingency Contract Strategy Guide. In this video, I'm gonna show you multiple methods to deal with the red katana. Hey, it's Che from Team WNJ here. Welcome back. If you have not seen part one already, please watch part one first where I show you the four main threats and how to deal with the gas mask, as well as several disclaimers just to make sure that these strategy guides are actually for you. As a reminder, here are the Red Katana's actual stats on max risk. They have 66,600 HP, 1,248 attack, 805 defense and 50% res. Furthermore, after they drop below 50% health, their attack increases to 3,500 plus an attack speed bonus. And if you allow them to pass the Originium tile, then they will have an attack of 5,746. Again, you do not need to take these risks. However, it is an option if you want to do so. The following risks will make the Red Katana harder and they add up to 19 risks. So if you want to dedicate your entire team just to dealing with the Red Katana, that is an option, but I would heavily advise against that. I'm going to make a video in the future about how to choose risks without being an idiot. For now, if you choose these tags for 19 risks, it's going to be unnecessarily difficult. Let's take a look at their path. The Katana spawn on the top left and walk all the way around the outside till they get to your base. There are a total of four regular yellow Katanas and two red Katanas. Don't forget that the regular Katanas are buffed as well. It's just that the red Katanas are on a whole nother level. Now, let's take a look at how we deal with them. The first strategy I'm going to show you is extremely flexible. It is the slow push strategy. This was used for 18 risk clears all the way to 25 risk clears. You do not need to do 25 risk clear. You can do whatever clear you want to do. This guide is for 18 and above. This will work for 18 risk. The first thing you need for this strategy is either a Shaw or a Feeder. They must have M3 skill one. Skill one is used because of its short cooldown time and you must have M3 in order to push at force two. The Katana and Red Katana both have a weight of two, meaning you have to shift them with a force of two or higher in order for anything significant to happen. You do not need Shaw and Feeder, it's Shaw or Feeder. The second operator you'll need is Magalan. So what do you do if you don't have Magalan? Well, you can either take Angelina, Estina, and Glaucus plus a Manticore. Earth Spirit and Orchid could work as well, it's just I haven't seen it so I can't recommend it. If you do choose to use the slow supporters, it is a good idea to bring Manticore, however Manticore is not necessary. You can actually use Manticore all by herself as well, however I'd only be comfortable with that after I M3 her skill. If you only have a Manticore and she's not M3'd, or if you just have a slow supporter without a Manticore, that's fine as well. You can grab someone from friend support, you don't have to though, I'll explain in a second. This here is the overview of the strategy. Feeder's job here is to continuously punch the katanas back up, while the slow operator's job is to make sure the katana never actually touches Feeder. This will give enough time for Feeder to recharge her SP and then punch them up again. All you're trying to do is bounce them up and down continuously until the end of the match where everyone else is dead except the katanas. Then you undeploy your entire team and you redeploy them just to kill the katana guys. Theoretically, the katana should never ever touch feeder. This means that this strategy can use the risk three katana, the super scary one, the max risk one. You can actually do that. Let's take a look at a deeper analysis. Now, very strangely, Magalan, who is a summoner using skill one level seven is able to slow for 0.9 seconds while actual slow supporters only slow for 0.8. And this is true for Angelina, Istina, Glaucus, Earth Spirit, and Orchid. Now, some of you guys might be thinking, oh, if I'm going to be running Magalan, I might have to take away one of my units so that I can actually deploy Magalan's drone. But this is not the case. You do not need to deploy Magalan's drone. Read her passive carefully. Magalan and her drones slow all enemies within attack range for 0.9 seconds every three seconds, meaning Magalan herself also slows the enemies. You do not need to deploy a single drone. You can, especially if you're using a Magalan strategy to deal with the gas mask, you could realistically use Magalan for both jobs. The only place that you can't put Shaw and Feeder is F10. You could even have Shaw or Feeder on G10 facing left. As long as you can blast them backwards and slow them before they can get back to you, that's fine. F9 is a very important spot because once you take the risk to get rid of some tiles on the map, F9 will be the only ranged tile available. Finally, if you're running Manticore, put her on G9 to G10. Heck, you could even put her on G8 or G7. As long as you can slow all of them before they get back to feeder, it'll work. 
Now, some of you guys might be thinking, if I don't have any DPS, doesn't that mean that Theater will have to bounce around four regular katanas and two red katanas? Doesn't that mean that I have to bring a DPS unit as well? And the answer is yes. The more katanas that Feeder has to bounce around, the higher the chances of something going wrong. You don't ever really want more than two katanas being bounced around by Feeder at the same time. So you do need some sort of DPS to kill them, but this can be anything. A good example for this is Silver Ash on F7 facing downwards, because when he activates his true Silver Slash, he's not only able to hit the red katana, but he's also able to support your front line. Feeder here is actually a better option than Shaw because Feeder slows the enemies that she hits. Feeder also has physical dodge while Shaw has magical resist. Why is this important? You'll see in a second. Ethan cannot replace Manticore, and this is extremely important. Ethan will not work here because of something I dub the big problem, which I'll get to on the next page. There are several RNG elements here depending on how you play this. If you are running a slow supporter like Angelina, Estina, or Glaucus without Manticore, or if you're just running Manticore on skill 7, this may happen where the katana actually gets close enough to Feeder and hits her. Remember that Feeder has a 40% RNG dodge, meaning you may be able to dodge it. If not, Feeder could get one shot to death. If Feeder dies, your run dies. However, you can just try this again since it doesn't cost any sanity. You don't really lose much from trying. Now we get to what the big problem is. This is why you can't use Ethan, and this is why the strategy is actually harder than it looks. I've used this diagram here to illustrate what's going on. Red Katana B is right in front of Feeder when Feeder's SP is at max. Red Katana A is walking towards Feeder. Because Red Katana B is right in front of Feeder, Feeder is able to push Red Katana B. So Red Katana B gets sent flying away. However, Red Katana A is unaffected because Red Katana A is not in range. Red Katana A will continue walking towards Feeder. Because Feeder has just finished pushing, Feeder now does not have enough SP to push Red Katana A away. Red Katana A is now directly in front of Feeder, meaning Red Katana A will have the opportunity to kill Feeder. The reason Ethan does not work here is because Ethan's bind is RNG, meaning if A and B were together, that would be the ideal situation, but if Ethan decides that he wants to bind one of them and desynchronize them, you will have this problem. So how do you go about fixing this? Let's take a look at an actual example where this happened and how they fixed it. This is a 25 risk clear by Dian Feng Ji Hua, or Pinnacle Project. The Chinese is still rusty as all hell. So the first thing to note here is that Feeder is actually set really far back. This allows Texas to be able to hit the one block over here. Now watch what happens. One of the red katanas has stepped into Feeder's range early. So meaning only one of these katanas gets sent flying backwards. The other one is walking towards Feeder as Feeder's SP is at zero. At this point, Texas is popped so that she can stun the red katana for three seconds. Be aware that Texas will need M1 for this. And after three seconds, the red katana has been stunned enough for the other katana to catch up. Now that they are both on the same tile, Feeder is able to shove both of them at once and they will stay together for the rest of the match. If you choose to use Project Red, you will need to rely on RNG a little bit. Remember, Red only stuns for 2 seconds, while Texas stuns for 3, and 3 is exactly what we need. Note, Red can stun for 3 seconds, but you have to M3 her. What? Texas can stun for 3 seconds at M1. If you give the Red Katanas even just 1 second of not stun time, that's 1 second where you could potentially die. Again, you don't really lose anything if you fail it, so you can just keep trying this again until you get good RNG. As for my recommendation, I think everybody should be able to do this, and even if you don't have a slow operator, you can always borrow a Magalan from friends. Keep in mind, all you need for this is an E1 Magalan, you don't need an E2 Magalan. And I mean, even if you're super desperate and you can't borrow a friend support Magalan because you're borrowing a friend support for someone else, honestly, I, I really do think that Orchid might work here, but that's a really big might. Because the main thing isn't the damage, right? The main thing is that you're slowing them so that they don't touch feed. And with all the slow supporters, you're slowing them by 0.8, meaning they will touch feeder at some point and you're just playing the RNG game here. However, all you need for that is just to run it over and over and over again until you get a good RNG run. Now, if you're extremely broke in the game right now, I believe that this might work. You can raise Shaw's skill 1 all the way to M3, and because Shaw is a 4-star, it shouldn't really cost you a fortune. Then you can grab a friend support Maglan. I wrote E2 here. It really could be E1. I don't see a need for the E2. Do I recommend the strategy? I do, because this is the only real easy strategy to do 3-risk katana. The other strategies that you're going to see can do 3-risk katana, but it'll be super, super dicey. They're more built for 2-risk katana. This strategy, for sure, for sure you can handle 3-risk katana. Me personally, I'm using this strategy. Oh yeah, we've got this Discord server, and if you join in right now, we can give you personalized tips for your team to clear contingency contract at a high risk. The link is in the description. 
Strategy two, the E1 only strat or the stall strategy. I do not like calling this the E1 only strategy. Stop lighting up. I know you're excited because it's E1 only. This strategy is for risk two only. At risk three, those guys hit a bit too hard and they have a bit too much health. I don't think you'll be able to kill them in time unless you have super high level guys. I have seen a full E2 team do this exact strategy with risk two katanas only and still have their entire team cut down. Now, if you have the right units, this strategy is actually super easy to build and most people should be able to do this. And the final note here is that the more DPS you have, the better. Let's take a look at what units are being used here. Okay, so we have Quora at E1 max using skill two level seven. Quora is replaceable with Neural. You can use Quora and Neural since Neural doubles as a healer. Neural is also on E160 using skill one on level seven. Then next, you're gonna have to have some DPS. Silver Ash here is pretty good at E240 or above, using skill 3 at level 7 or above. If you don't have Silver Ash, you can use Scotty at E180 or E2. If you have her at potential 3, you don't need to E2 her. She will be using skill 2 at level 7. If you have both Silver Ash and Scotty, you can use both of them. I would advise using both of them. Finally, you're going to need some healers. So as I mentioned earlier, you can bring Neural across here as well. Myrtle at E140 or above using skill 2 level 7 or above. And or you can have Saria at E160. 70 or above using skill one or two at level seven or above skill one or two depends on where you put Saria. If you have all six of these units, you can actually use all six at the same time. If you don't have all six of these units, all you really need here is one from each category. Let's take a look at how they're deployed. So basically what's going to happen is you're going to use your main defender, whether that be Korra or Neural to tank the red katanas all the way until you get to the very end where every other enemy is dead. Then same as before, undeploy every single other operator except this one defender, then redeploy all of them just to kill the red katana. Let's take a look at the deeper analysis. First thing I wrote here is the question of how you can call this an E1 strategy when Silver Ash is E2. Remember, you do not need Silver Ash. You can be replaced with Scotty on potential three. Potential three because of the redeployment cooldown minus four. Or you have to E2 Scotty because Scotty has a self redeploy time minus 10 seconds at E2. It is probably easier for you to E2 Silver Ash or E2 Scotty than it is to get potential three Scotty. That's why I like to call this the stall strategy. I don't like to call this the E1 only strategy. If you wanted to use all six of the units that I mentioned earlier, this is one of the deployments you could use. Sorry is using skill two here, so she has a range to heal Korra. Neural and Myrtle are both also healing Korra. Scotty's doing her thing back there, and Silver Ash has the range to Xingxing -xing them from way back there. Now, what you cannot do is put Korra on G7 because the Red Katana cannot touch the Originium tile. If they touch the Originium tile, they will be too strong. So, I mean, super flexible. As long as you can put them in range, you're good to go. In a strange twist of events, Scotty is technically better than Silver Ash here. And here's why. Remember that Korra or Neural can tank the Red Katana as long as they aren't spicy. If one of them gets spicy, Korra can die. Even when she has her skill up and even when she's being healed, those guys hit hard and they can kill your Quora. Now, if two of them get spicy at the exact same time and they are not killed quickly, Quora is 100% dead. Remember that Quora is the only thing stopping them from getting to the Originium tile. Once they pass the Originium tile, every single thing gets one shot to death. Now, Scotty only hits one at a time, so it's very unlikely for two spicy red katanas to happen at the exact same time. On the contrary, True Silver Slash hits every single thing in range. Meaning, if you have a mediocre True Silver Slash that is not strong enough to kill the two red katanas, you're just gonna make them both spicy. And if they both get spicy at the same time and you don't have enough True Silver Slash to kill them, then they'll kill your core and they'll walk past. Now, if you do have a E290 M3 Silver Ash, that might be enough to kill them outright just using the True Silver Slash. If, if that is you, that might be fine. But if you have a mediocre True Silver Slash, be a bit careful. The solution to this is to calm down on your True Silver Slash. Don't pop True Silver Slash the second it's ready. Wait for the first red katana to turn spicy first, then turn on True Silver Slash and hope that you have enough damage to kill both of them. As for my recommendation, I highly recommend this strategy because it is a super popular strategy and very easy to do. I'll break it down to pros and cons for you. The first pro here is that the E2 Scotty slash Silver Ash is way easier to get than an M3 feeder plus a supporter. Second of all, there's not much brain needed. You don't need to stun them and make sure they're together. All you need to do is just group up and hit it till it dies. As for the cons of the strategy, well, you can't do max risk katana. Remember, you do not need to do max risk katana. Doing two risk katana might be enough for you to get to 18 risk. Depending on the levels of your guys, especially Silver Ash, it can be a bit dicey if you make two of them angry at the same time. 
So the strategies that I've shown you so far, they're pretty cool and they're pretty easy to replicate. They're also really important to learn from. However, what if I showed you a strategy that is really, really bad? Like, so bad to the point where I have to completely remove it from the guide and I'm currently re-recording this part of the video. Yeah, let's take a look at a really bad strategy that actually works, but analyze why it's bad. Okay, so this is the closed lane Swartz strategy. The first thing you're gonna notice is the amount of operators that you need in order to pull this off. And with this amount of operators, you'd expect to be able to do three risk katana, right? But no, this strategy is only for two risk katana. You can do three risk katana, but you literally need every single person here. And even if you have them, let's take a look at their level requirements. Swartz E250 and above, skill three must be M1. Heliger and Spectre are interchangeable here. They must be E260 or above. Their skills must be m 3 And this is all you need for the two risk katana. But if you were to do three risk katana, you would also need to have Silver Ash at E270 or above with a skill three m 3 Saria at E270 or above with skill one level six. This can be replaced with any healing defender. And finally, Scotty at E170 using skill two. This is what's actually going to happen. Swartz is on F9 facing downwards, and this is why the M1 is necessary in order for her to hit the B9 tile. So pretty simple for two risk katana, but for three risk katana, it gets a lot more chaotic. If you were doing the three risk katana without Scotty and Silver Ash, you simply would not be able to dish out enough damage, and the red katana would cut through Spectre or Heliger. Needless to say, if you are running Heliger, you do not need a healing defender to heal him. As for the analysis, the reason Spectre and Heliger can be replaced is because Heliger, when he activates his skill, has a 75% chance dodge. This means you only really have a 25% fail chance. While Spectre here is technically a better option because she can be outright invincible, so there's no RNG involved. However, you may find that her skill doesn't charge up in time, which is why Saria is a good idea because Saria can also SP battery. Now, as for my recommendations. Why would you do this? This is more work for less results. If you really wanted to do three vis katana, just do slow push. Like seriously, all these operators here are really good at doing their thing, but you're taking them out of doing that thing and you're making them do something that they're not that good at. Swartz and Spectre are better off being used against a gas mask. Heliger is better off being used against the casters. Silver Ash and Scotty are better off used against the top caster. So why would you take all of those guys who are good at doing that thing and force them to do this thing when you could just use Kung Fu Panda and a penguin. I don't understand why you would do this. I do not recommend it. If you wanna do it, go ahead. Oh yeah, did you guys know that only 10% of people watching this video have subscribed? Anna? Hey, I put a lot of effort into these guys and I really do hope that you guys find them entertaining and informative. Share this video to your friends and subscribe if you have not already. Let's try to hit 20% because that would really help motivate me to make more of these videos. Hey, listen, I I I'm sorry. I'm sorry you had to see that. I'm sorry I even thought to include it in the guide. But let me make it up to you. This here is the Angie Blast strategy used to clear 25 risk, again by the lads at Rhyme Lab Experimental. This strategy requires two non-replaceable operators. They are Angelina and Heliger, both at E2 max, skill 2, M3. Now, I just said that these two strategies were easy. So how come I'm now saying E2 max and skill 2, M3? Well, the guys at Rhyme Lab Experimental did it at 25 risk, you do not need to do it at 25 risk. I don't think you'll need to get such high stats for 18 risk clear. Here's what the strategy looks like. Angelina is on F9 facing downwards on skill two. Whenever a katana walks past, she pops her skill and can absolutely shred them down to a sliver of health. If Angelina is unable to kill the katana upright, that's okay because Heliger will be there to finish him off. As for the deeper analysis, Heliger must be E2 in order for him to self-heal when he's not blocking any enemies. Angelina's E2 does give extra heal, however, Angelina's E2 will not be enough to heal Heliger entirely. It is a good idea to E2 both of them, that way Heliger can heal himself as much as possible. Now, if Angelina is not strong enough to kill the Red Katana, there is a chance that Heliger may need to block the Red Katana directly. When this happens, make sure you activate Heliger's skill 2 for the 75% chance dodge. The more health the Red Katana has, the more chances he has to kill your Heliger. Ideally, you want your Angelina as strong as possible so that by the time the Red Katana gets to Heliger, Heliger can kill him within a matter of seconds. If RNG hates you and you land on a 25% chance and your Heliger dies, just restart it and try it again, you don't really lose anything. Now, if your Heliger's skill ends and the Red Katana is still not dead, that's a big problem. You need to either turn down one of your wrists or level up Heliger and Angelina to the point where they can kill the Red Katana. 
I really like the strategy and I highly recommend it. I would go as far to say that this is easier than the slow push strategy, however, it's more dependent on RNG. Unlike the slow push strategy where you have to M3 feeder, there is no M3 required here. And furthermore, m 3 ing feeder, feeder is not someone that you would use that much in the regular game. But Angelina and Heliger, they see a lot of frequent use in the regular game. So if you don't want to spend resources on people who aren't that universal, hey, you spend less resources on this strategy and both the operators are pretty universal. The only problem is that if you don't have Angelina, finding a friend support Angelina set to skill two is kind of rare. But if you have Angelina and Heliger, congratulations. I think you found your strategy. Now, here's a strategy that only requires one operator at E1 level one and everybody has this operator. This is the get over here strategy for 18 risk. You need either cliff heart or rope. If you do not have these two operators, you are clearly not ready for contingency contract. Everybody gets cliff heart on day seven. Don't get too excited just yet because this strategy is mainly for the people using the caster strategy to deal with the gas mask from part one. This doesn't mean that if you're not using the caster strategy, you can't do this. I would recommend watching this anyway, just to see if you can take some of the principles and apply it to your own team. As for what you're actually doing, it's very, very simple. You need to deploy Cliffheart at the right time to pull the katanas back. This will keep them in range of the caster so that you can continuously do damage to them. As for the deeper analysis, whether you use Cliffheart or Rope won't really make a difference. However, I prefer Cliffheart as she does more damage. And a very, very important thing to note here is that Cliffheart or Rope's pull will not last forever. Allow me to explain. The katanas have a weight of two, meaning you have to pull them with a force of two or higher to pull them infinitely back. Cliffheart and Rope's pull strength at skill level seven is only one. In order for you to pull at strength two, you must have M3 on the first skill. The reason you can still pull them using force one, even though they are weight two, is because in Arknights, if you have force one and the thing has weight two, it's not that they don't move, it's just that they don't move as far. So you can continuously pull them back. However, you would pull them back more if you are using M3. The reason this is important is because if you do not have enough DPS to kill them and they walk out of Cliffheart or Rope's range, there is nothing stopping them from passing. You have to make sure that your DPS is enough to kill them. As for my recommendations, I find that E1 Cliffheart is a very handy operator to have in the main game. She's by no means necessary, but I find her pretty fun to use, so I don't think that's a wasted investment. E1 level 1 Cliffheart is also much easier to raise than an M3 feeder. However, I can only recommend this for doctors using the caster strategy from the previous video. If you are not using the caster strategy, you may still be able to use this. However, I think there are better options for you. The next video will go over how to deal with casters and maybe the top casters as well. If you enjoyed this video or found it helpful, please share the video around, then subscribe and hit that bell icon so that you can get notified when part 3 comes out. Cheers!